Hi, good morning, or good afternoon, rather. <laughs> Welcome to week three, Black Voices Matter, Lexus lecture series in recognition of Black History Month. This year's theme is belonging. While Black History Month is nationally recognized, ABERG recognizes that Black history occurs every day of the year. Today, we have a fantastic guest, and we cannot wait to introduce you to her. Please note that we have a, we will have a special session from 1 to 1.30 to have a Q&A with our speaker. However, don't forget to post your questions in the chat. Our committee will keep their eyes on the chat to make certain that your questions are answered. In addition, please don't forget to complete the evaluation at the end. We'll make certain we share that link with you as well. Again, welcome. I am Quintella Perry. Licensed Health Insurance Navigator with Covering Wisconsin, Aberg's Professional Development Committee, me committee me member, and part of the Health and Wellbeing Division of Extension. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. In the last two sessions, hosts shared a Black moment of past pioneers. Today, the moment we'll share is a message from Little Bella a fourth grader, a future leader in K-4 who lives in Tennessee, and the goddaughter of our Aberg member, Rhonda Davis. Please, please be with us in mind, body, and spirit as we share this, this Black history moment with you. We're not hearing the sound, sorry. You guys are not hearing the sound. Yeah, can't okay, hear the sound. Let's try it now. Welcome to the Black History Moment. Today is Valentine's Day and also my daddy's birthday. My daddy was a college football player and a running back for the University of Alabama. In 2002, he rushed for to 900 yards. He currently shares a University of Alabama record for the most touchdowns in a single game. With five. He is tied with NFL running back Sean Alexander, but most importantly, he's my dad. I love you and I miss you, Daddy. <laughs> Have a very happy birthday. This has been my Black History Moment. Come back tomorrow for another Black History Moment. Welcome, Bella. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. That is awesome. Appreciated that. <laughs> so again, thank you for sharing your lunch hour with the African American Black Employee Resource Group, ABERG. ABERG is purposeful and it is a resource to service and foster current and future African American colleagues in the success by sponsoring programming, providing collegial support, encouraging belonging and raising a collective voice related to issues that impact employees ability to thrive personally and professionally we would love to hear your feedback and we'll provide a link to the survey in the chat box as we close out this session i want to take the time to acknowledge our committee members as well miss danielle harrison green who is our chair rick mills secretary Eva Terry, Treasurer, James Boiling, and Catherine Bark Smock, Co Chair Membership, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Co Chair Membership and Retention Committee, <clears throat> Carla Williams and Atifa Robinson, Co Chair Marketing and Media Committee, and then Interim Professional Development Shared Leadership Team, Ms. Jenny Abel, Aaron Conway, 
Monica Lobenstein, Ms. Cheryl Isabel, and Heather Quackenboss. I am super excited to introduce Dr. Stacy Sowell, who will present today on the Help Meet and the Head, how the gender impacts liberation in the Black community. As a brief bio for, Ms. Doc for Dr. Stacy Stowell, Vice President for Enrollment Manager and Student Affairs at West Virginia State University. Dr. Sowell holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, and a Master's of Arts degree in English and African American Literature from North Carolina AT&T State University. In addition, she is a 2022 North Carolina A&T State University graduate with a PhD in Leadership Studies. Her dissertation, The Help Me and the Head, Gender Mentoring in HBCU Women, Women's Leaderships and Women Leaders, examined gender experiences within the HBCU community and how diverse mentoring networks help women succeed and glide the, and climb the ladder of success. To review her field bio, please visit the ABIRDS SharePoint site. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Stacy Sowell. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, my um, overarching topic is the help mate in the head. Um, we will cover a little bit about how um, gender impacts Black women um, and specifically about how gender impacts women in leadership um, at HBCUs. I wanted to give a little bit of background about how I, how I came up with this topic. Um, I have a group of girlfriends who uh, were all in higher education and um, we all have done all the things, the professional development, um, we have the mentors, we've been to all of the conferences, we've talked to all of the people. And we were sitting around one evening wondering why in the world, you know, after it's, it's five of us, four of us have a doctorate, we've all been in higher education a long time. We were like, why are we being um, surpassed light by light years, um, you know, by uh, our men counterparts who have less experience. So I was inspired to take that and turn it into my dissertation topic. And so today I'll present a condensed version of that. Um, and I look forward to your questions um, surrounding that research. In general, my um, research interests uh, include race, gender, politics, religion, and class, you know, all of the stuff people tell you not to discuss at work. Um, those are the things I like to read about and dive deeper into. Uh, specifically, I, I like to talk about um, Black women's gendered experiences in majority Black spaces. Uh, we love to talk about all of the isms um, when it comes to Black people, but we don't talk about sexism uh, when it comes to Black women and how that, how that looks when sexism, patriarchy, and misogynoir is perpetuated by Black men in majority Black spaces um, toward Black women. Um, so that's kind of a taboo subject in the community, but we're going to talk about it a little bit today. And my screen won't progress, so give me a moment. My computer is very old. Here we go, okay. So I've given the background. Um, the American Council on Education has been conducting research about the collegiate pres presidency since 1998. And so what they have found is that the collegiate presidency really has not changed at all um, since they started researching it. Um, 
men make up the lion's share of presidents across the country and 80% um, of those presidents are, are white. Um, so just as an FYI throughout this particular presentation, when I say women, um, I'm speaking specifically about black women. If, I, if I'm talking about other women, I will designate that um, just as an FYI. Uh, so women of color in general make up only 5% of all college presidents. The ACE surveys um, have also found that women are, women's resumes are longer. They tend to be older when they get into the executive level of leadership in higher education um, compared to their male counterparts. Um, and when you pull out black women by themselves, they're even older than their white, white counterparts. They have more leadership experience. They tend to have already been an interim college president or served in an interim executive position. Um, they have much more uh, leadership development and professional development experiences, and they have a very wide network of um, mentors, champions, and sponsors. Um, so still, despite women in general, all women being um, more prepared for these presidencies with these different experiences, women's leadership in the collegiate space has actually declined since 2017. Um, the profile of the college president, the, your average college president, they tend to be, of course, a man, white, heterosexual, cisgendered, married to a woman, 55 years of, of age or older, and they usually possess um, some sort of doctorate degree. So just share the profile of the average college president. Um, one of the reasons that uh, women aspiring to executive leadership may experience some, some backlash or some barriers or challenges, there's still stereotypes about women in leadership that women are, women lead from emotions and men lead from logic and um, that, you know, women who are in leadership or women who aspire to executive leadership are not feminine. Um, and, and you see that lack of femininity um, stereotype even stronger when you're looking at Black women by themselves. Uh, women have a lack of influential sponsors. Um, we'll get a little bit uh, more into that later on um, when we talk about some of the some of the relevant literature. Um, organizational structures and dual biases of race and gender um, hinder Black women specifically. Um, so imagine, you know, you already have racial bias, uh, overarching, and then you're also a woman and all of the stereotypes and biases that go with that um, hindering black women. One thing we'll also get into late, a little later in the, in the presentation is patriarchy. Patriarchy is an overarching um, global uh, institution. It permeates every organization that there is churches, the military, family structures, um, educational institutions, nonprofits. You cannot get away from patriarchy. It doesn't matter what your culture is, what country you're in, um, what hemisphere you're on in the world. Um, patriarchal structures permeate every area of life. So why study HBCU women leaders? Um, you know what makes them so special. Um, I wanted to examine why, you know, out of 105, there were 105 accredited HBCUs at the time I wrote my dissertation. At that time, there were 19 women who were presidents and 85, uh, 85 of them had women in the president's cabinet. Um, since then, <laughs> nine of those women have left the presidency. So there are even less uh, women uh, presidents at HBCUs today than there were when I defended my dissertation. It is January 23. I defended my dissertation June 2022. It's only been, excuse me, it's February. It's been like six months since I defended and nine women have left the HBC presidency. Um, so I wanted to determine what um, impacted the career trajectory of Black women who uh, became, eventually became executive leaders. 
So here you have a photo that depicts my theoretical framework that I use to examine um, the literature and interpret the participant data. Um, patriarchy, as I um, detailed earlier, you know, it is a global worldwide um, institution. And so it is depicted here as a weight on a woman's back, um, something that she carries around with her at all times. And misogynoir, which is a specific type of misogyny that is perpetuated against Black women by Black men, is seen as a ball and chain uh, around the woman's uh, foot. So, you know, what makes HBCU so difficult to navigate from an executive standpoint? Um, HBCUs, while, you know, we celebrate the HBCU culture, um, a lot and it's become more popular to support HBCUs financially and, and all of that, um, HBCUs are extremely conservative. And so that conservatism um, that's entrenched at HBCUs really prevents women from um, ascending to the C-suite and executive level of leadership. Uh, it's a battle for women to just um, exist and justify their existence, even within the HBCU um, environment. So patriarchy is also an integral part of HBCU conservative culture. Um, many HBCUs were founded by religious entities. And so the tenets of those religious entities are built into the um, traditions of those HBCUs. And so, uh, you know, arguably a lot of religious entities are also, you know, pay, very patriarchal and have either eliminated completely or limited uh, women's participation in leadership. So even in an HBCU majority black environment, misogynoir is a specific type of barrier um, that black women face when they're trying to navigate, um, you know, from entry level to, to middle management to um, executive leadership. So these stereotypes that exist within patriarchal structures, within misog misogyny and misogynoir are specifically detrimental to African-American women. Literature, as far back as people have been studying um, Black people, um, depict Black women as hyper-masculine, super women, the strong Black woman, hypersexual lacking femininity. Um, and so you have this dichotomy for women who, who desire leadership positions. Um, am I supposed to be strong in my leadership or am I supposed to be democratic and soft and easygoing? And do I, do I um, address things or not address things? So all of these stereotypes are plus this conservatism are swirling around at HBCUs and they are barriers for women who desire these positions. So what's next? Um, there's a disproportionate number of women who are in the academy pipeline at all US colleges and universities. That's from the community college level on up to your, um, your four-year institutions. But they have yet to ex uh, achieve executive status. I have a colleague from um, my cohort who studied women dean at women academic deans. She studied academic leaders. I studied administrative leaders. Both of our studies, um, you know, black women have a significant amount of difficulty achieving these positions. Um, so current the current research did not focus on black women, and it lumped all women together or all black people together. I pulled out Black women specifically alone. Um, mentoring experiences and education research did not also didn't focus on Black women, and it certainly did not specifically focus on HBCUs. Either all women were lumped together, all Black people were lumped together, all colleges and universities were lumped together. Um, misogynoir at HBCUs is a specific um, specific type of issue, and it needed to be pulled out by itself. Um, and it's also important to examine the impact that mentoring had on Black women's ability to ascend to the executive leadership level, specifically at HBCUs. 
Now let's talk about implicit bias. Um, of course, obviously, I am a, a woman who, in, a person who in, identifies as a woman. I identify as African American and Black American interchangeably. Um, at the time I wrote this this dissertation, I was not an executive leader. I am now. Um, I was a middle manager and aspired to this level of leadership. And, um, you know, I, admittedly, I was experiencing literally all of these things that I am going to talk about or have already talked about um, throughout this presentation. Um, I have been sexually harassed at work. Um, you know, I have been uh, disrespected and dismissed um, along the way. So, um, I had to put my biases aside, kind of in a little box, um, to perform to perform this work. But I also have to admit that I have these things um, going on with, within me as I'm talking about it. Okay. So, what do other people say? And you'll notice throughout the um, throughout the presentation, I do have uh, visual representations of women who are in or have have been in leadership at the United States. Uh, historically black colleges and universities. So other people say um, prior to the 20th century, um, HBCU leadership looked extremely different. Um, there was an 104 year time span between Mary McLeod Bethune and Spelman College getting their first woman president, 104 years. So your oldest HBCUs aren't quite 200 years old and more than half of that time period, there were literally no women leaders. Um, also prior to, you know, 1940s or so, um, most HBCUs were also led by white men. Um, HBCUs experienced disproportionate internal and external threats. Um, so internally, you know, there are, um, there's limited giving among alumni, and I think that's very commonly known. Externally, every year we literally have a conversation about, are HBCUs still relevant? Do we still need them? You know, they have to always justify their existence. Um, because of these internal and external threats, um, and because of the long history of tradition and conservatism at HBCUs, shared governance really looks different there. Um, it's more, your accrediting bodies really are looking for shared governance between the faculty and administration, but shared governance at an HBCU is very community centered. Everyone has a voice, faculty, staff, alumni, students, community, stakeholders, donors, everybody has an almost equal say in what happens at an HBCU. Um, you know, a college dean, can move the needle just as fast as an influential community member. It just kind of depends on what's what they're talking about at the time. Um, the pathway to African-American leadership in higher education really goes through HBCUs. A lot of um, people would not have their opportunities had they not um, either gone to school at an HBCU, received a degree there, done an internship there, had some sort of practicum, in service something at an HBCU. So in talking about higher education leadership um, in general, the college presidency has existed for about 350 years. Again, it really has looked just about the same that entire 350 years. Um, the ACE survey um, and they've been researching common presidential competencies since 1988. They've been surveying colleges and university presidents since 1998. And they identified 17 common competencies such as um, crisis management, athletics management, enrollment management, fiscal stability. And even though they have, they have identified these 17 competencies, there is literally no job description of a college president. There is no standard of experience. Um, typically, you want somebody who has led a large organization with a similar size budget and number of employees, but 
some college presidents have doctorates, the majority of them do, but you're also seeing people who have um, uh, political experience, legal experience, military experience, that's, that's very commonplace now. Um, so there's literally no, you know, uniformity in, you know, the pathway to the collegiate presidency. Again, your average college president is a white man married to a woman, heterosexual, cisgender, has children, Protestant, has a doctorate, and has typically served for seven years. Um, African Americans are still underrepresented in um, this particular this particular uh, subset. Um, specific to African American women in higher education leadership, um, HBCUs in particular are over over uh, dependent on male leadership, despite competent women. I mean, the teaching ranks. Your middle managers are full of women. Um, all of these, a lot of these women have done um, professional development, credentialed themselves, continue to credential themselves. They present, they produce scholarship, and they still are having issues progressing um, into executive leadership. The profile of the collegiate president remains unchanged. Again, um, your first real crop of women, uh, Black women leaders at HBCUs didn't emerge until the 1980s. And in 2023, um, you know, I'm 43 years old. I was born in 1980. Now there's still some HBCUs that are still having their first woman president. Um, so between 1904 and 2007, 40 women were appointed to the HBCU presidency. Um, but, you know, after that, at any one given time, you may have 20 women who um, are representing HBCU presidencies, um, but not 40 at one time. African American women are an emerging group of leaders. Um, you know, as a segment of the U United States society, they are one of the most educated, or we are one of the most educated. Um, they are an emerging uh, group of entrepreneurs as well. Um, but still not being given a chance for various reasons to ascend to education leadership. So the influence of patriarchy and misogynoir on um, HBCU leadership. Typically in the black community, racial uplift is part of the HBCU mission and story. Um, HBCUs bat above their weight when it comes to impacting um, you know, the social mobility of Black people. Uh, but that racial uplift often is interpreted as man uplift. If you look at the civil rights movement, the Black arts movement, the Black power movement, all the way up until the Black Lives Matter movement, all of these movements in the United States that were about racial uplift, specifically about Black and Brown people, were led and, and centered um, on Black men um, being seen as men um, and and having uplift opportunities. It was not it was not an inclusive thing, um, and that translates into the conservatism and the tradition that is perpetuated at HBCUs as well. So misogynoir and gender bias um, in the DeGregory and Carter 2016 article, they talk about a group of 16 Black women who were appointed. Um, to the to the HBCU presidency between 2014 and 2015. By the time they wrote that article in 2016, half of the women who had been appointed in a two-year time span were gone. Now, one one of them pat one of them was ill and she passed away, but the other the others were terminated or they resigned um, because of various things. Also. Uh, one of the things that that uh, Black women face when they become presidents at HBCUs, particularly if they're single or divorced, is not having that first lady spouse to conduct those social events. Um, one of the traditions uh, at HBCUs is your, your president's wife will host teas and socials and things for donors 
um, luncheons, they'll do etiquette seminars. That was one of the things in my undergraduate experience, our president's wife did for us. She did an etic etiquette seminar and an etiquette dinner. When you become an HBC president, it's born out in the literature and born out in the, um, the interviews we'll talk about later in the presentation. You often have to function as the president, the executive leader, the C CEO of the institution, and the first lady. Um, a venerable HBCU president, uh, Dr. Uh, well, former HBCU president, Dr. Walter Kimbrough, um, wrote an article in 2021 where he talked about um, the same women who had become president uh, during, that were written about in the Gregory and Carter article um, and how those women faced that president and first lady dual role. Um, and it's, it's just part of that traditional um, face of HBCUs where women do certain things. Okay. Here's one of my favorite uh, former HBCU women presidents, Dr. Janetta B. Cole. Um, but the role of mentoring when it comes to women making it into these roles. Um, mentoring typically involves a junior uh, colleague and a senior colleague, and that junior colleague works with the senior colleague to learn the organization, to um, hone their skills, to you know, do professional development, have someone to bounce things off of, help them through sticky situations. Um, women who have these interpersonal relationships succeed. Um, and there's just plenty of research about that, but there's such a small amount of women who are able to leverage these mentoring relationships into um, successful leadership. So Sophia Nelson in her book, um, Black Woman Redefined from 2012, details that, that women have a lack of comfortable, trusted and strategic relationships at the senior level. Um, her book talked about women in the corporate uh, corporate America space, but it's translatable here. Um, those relationships are hard for women to develop and maintain. Men, even white men, even when they're dealing with black men, they have that we're both men, um, you know, kind of thing to, to work with together. When it comes to, if you're working somewhere and most of the leadership is, is men or on the corporate side, most of the leadership is white men. You don't even have your gender or gender expression or your uh, your your identity, your gendered identity to um, unify you. So you're seen kind of almost as an alien person in this 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 um, institutional structure. Uh, leadership does not represent changing demographics. More women are going to college, more women are entering the professorate, more black women specifically are obtaining um, advanced degrees. Of all uh, black people who obtain doctorate degrees, 60% of them are black women. And so the leadership does not represent those changing demographics. Um, more Black people are going to college than ever before, but only 8% of all higher education administrators are Black people. Okay, so let's get to the good part, <laughs> the findings. I interviewed um, 11 women, four of them were university presidents, and the rest were vice presidents, chiefs of staff, or exec, some, they sat somewhere in the president's executive leadership team. Um, several things emerged from those interviews. Uh, I had three themes and three sub themes. We won't talk about all of them today. We'll talk about the juicier ones today. Um, and uh, after we talk about those, then we can take questions. Um, so we'll talk about gender discrimination and misogynoir, the intersectionality of gender, race, and age, and the expectation of the helpmate caricature, which is where the title of the presentation and the paper came from. Um, interestingly enough, the intersectionality of gender, race, and age was not something that I intended to write about from the beginning, but when I started interviewing people, it just sort of popped out immediately. Um, 
a lot of the a lot of the women were you know young, a little bit younger um but there were some there were some older ladies and each of them mentioned their age without being prompted um so you know i had to add in a little bit about um how those three things intersect to to create their identity as leaders so we'll talk a little bit about that all right so gender discrimination experiences one of the presidents um was talking to her board of trustees about her salary um she had some uh significant wins as you know a fairly new president and when she was renegotiating her contract her board of trustees told her that she did not need the money that she was asking for because she had a husband who had a good job and that she dressed nice and she looked good and she was able to wear all the clothes that she wanted and so she didn't need the money despite the fact that she was doing um all of the the things she was supposed to do not just doing the things she was supposed to do but exceeding at those things her supervisor who was the board of trustees told her that because her husband had a good job you don't deserve this raise um this same president also detailed another presidential contract that she got she got a significant lower offer than her male predecessor and um the offer not it wasn't just the dollar amount that was lower her life insurance that the institution offered her was lower than her than her predecessor so you know read into that what you may she she was told that she wasn't deserving of the monetary compensation and then her life insurance policy was not was also not up to par um another vice president you know talked about being one of the youngest and one of the only woman women in the president's cabinet sitting around the table trying to offer ideas and strategies and being mansplained being talked over having her ideas not even considered another uh another participant who was a vice president she's a, a CFO chief financial officer she was um competing for a job prior to the one that she currently held or the one that she held at the time she was interviewed um and she was working with her mentor to to do this negotiation for this job they had offered it to a man prior to her and he turned it down well then they so her mentor had inside knowledge of of both offers so um they offered the man $225,000 for this particular job when he turned it down and they offered her they offered her $185,000 i'm going to let y'all guess who had the more experience between the two it was not the person who got the higher job higher dollar amount offer Misogynoir experiences, and keep in mind this is this speaks to um, experiences of misogyny or woman hating, if you will, that goes on specifically within the African American and Black community. So it is it is um, misogyny that is perpetuated toward Black women um, by Black men. Uh, so one of the uh, vice presidents just said, "Keep it real." It's a good old boy network that exists in the African American African American male community too. Um, that's a whole other dissertation, <laughs> but let's talk about it. Let's be honest with young professionals that there is there is a looking out. So she was stating that men look out for other men, um, whether it's uh, whether they are implicit with it or complicit with it, they bypass women when it comes to hiring. Um, another another president when she was named president she detailed an experience of 12 men coming to her office after hours to basically interrogate her about her leadership style about her plans for the university she had just been installed as president days prior and there was a group of 12 men outside of her office after five o'clock after her administrative assistant had left um she handled herself well 
but it, they 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 literally meant to come there together to intimidate her. Um, another president uh, detailed um, talking to other colleagues, women colleagues around the country who are in the presidency and who aren't in the presidency anymore. And one of the reasons is that, that the women are exiting the presidency is because of the way um, college and university boards uh, are treating them. And they, they believe they don't, you know, you can't prove it, but you know, you know it when you see it. They believe that they're, they're being treated this way because of their gender, their gender identity and expression. Um, so here we have the expectation of the helpmate car caricature. And for people who, are, who may or may not be familiar with the term helpmate, it is a biblical reference um, in Genesis when, when God created the earth, created Adam, and said, you know, it's not good for you to be alone. Let me let me make you a helper. And God gave Adam Eve for the, for those who are not familiar. So in in the King James version of the Bible, um, Eve is described as a helpmate or helpmeet, depending on what translation you're looking at. And because most HBCUs are religiously affiliated in the South, many in the Deep South where conservatism, conservatism is, is very strong and those religious traditions are also very strong. Um, many, many of the participants mentioned the word helpmate or help meet, feeling like they are the helper, whether they're the president or the vice president or the chief of staff, executive vice president, they are treated um, as if they are the helper. Um, so one vice president specifically said religious, religiously affiliated institutions, in fact, that their role of the help meet is still embedded in the construct. If the help, if the woman is the help meet, but the man is the head and the structure of a lot of our HBCUs with regards to women is you're not the head, you're the help meet, regardless of your title. Um, another president, talked about how similar um, the dynamic is to the black church. There are men in power, the structure and the structure um, and how that structure treats black women. So the intersection of race, gender and age, the, the age group of, there was no consistent age group um, of the, the women who were interviewed, but ironically, and what, what is very encouraging all of them saw their race, uh, not their race, excuse me, all of them saw their gender and their um, age as a help to them and not a hindrance. So despite, you know, all of the barriers that they, um, that they encountered along the way, and even while they were in their positions, they really had a great positive outlook and it was really encouraging to me that um, despite those things, they specifically, talking about their age, they, they specifically saw their age as a help, whether they were on the older end of the spectrum of participants or even on the younger end of the spectrum um, of participants, they all saw their age as helpful, um, as keeping them relevant, as um, you know, whether they were older and the students kind of looked at them as an aunt or a mom or a grandma, whatever, uh, or they were younger on the spectrum and they're great with social media or they understand uh, younger people, all of them uh, said that their age was helpful to them uh, when completing their job. So, <clears throat> excuse me, what does all of this mean? Still less than a fifth of HPCs are led by women excuse me, despite the high number of women on the faculty staff and amongst the student body at these institutions. Cultural barriers in the space um, and the mentoring relationship is integral in helping women break those barriers and reach their goals toward executive leadership in the space. The helpmate caricature is ever present <clears throat> and it's an expectation of subordination, humbling and a sabotage of, of African-American women Excuse me, and 
and it and it undergirds the relationship of HBCUs to Black church culture. And so, what does this mean um, for the future of HBCUs? As I stated before, college and university boards at HBCUs are mostly men. Um, and that is, you know, whether they are publicly affiliated or privately controlled, most of your boards are, are overwhelmingly men. They're overwhelmingly men over the age of 55. Um, and so what happens when they go into a presidential search? They pick a person who fits into their group. Um, so to move the space forward, those boards must be restructured to more closely reflect the gender parity of student bodies, um, faculty and staff. They also need to be trained on gender equity, implicit bias and inclusivity so that the presidential hiring process is free as free of gender bias as possible. Um, C-suite executive presidential cabinets also must have gender parity. Um, a lot of my research around um, finding the presidential cabinets that had women in them, um, you know, you'd see a man president that had nothing but women in his presidential cabinet, or you'd see a woman who only had men in her presidential cabinet. And, and it literally was, was skewed like that, or, or you'd have a, a, pres a man president that had two women and six men, you know, and so you know those women are getting drowned out <laughs> in, um, you know, in cabinets. So those cabinets also need to uh, reflect gender parity and have nationwide searches for cabinet level positions. Um, you know, you need the, the background check processes for senior leaders needs to be improved so that you prevent recycling of leaders who have misconduct issues. Um, and you have to fund the processes that are already in place to protect women against discrimination at all levels of leadership. Okay, um, what does it mean for professional development organizations? We've all seen flyers for professional development organizations um, and they list their keynote speakers and it's mostly men. <laughs> you know, they need to ensure that experienced women leaders have, key par have parity among the keynotes, panelists, hosts, moderators, and planning committees. Um, ensure both women and men participants attend mandatory plenary sessions pertaining to women in leadership. A lot of times you'll see PD sessions for women in, or about women in leadership. You'll go into them and the whole audience is women. You know, it's like if you put woman on something, the men think that they shouldn't go or can't go or they don't want to go. Um, so that should be part of the mandatory, um, the mandatory sessions. Uh, PD sessions, that cater to HBCUs specifically or African-American um, academic professional must develop a, a consultation template for succession planning that is inclusive of women in the leadership pipeline. So in conclusion, um, again, patriarchy and misogynoir is pervasive. It continues, it's not even a glass ceiling for, for women at HBCUs. It's something harder than, than glass. Um, mentoring, um, we didn't talk a whole lot about mentoring, but uh, having cross-gender mentoring experiences, diverse diversity among your mentoring experiences is integral in helping Black women overcome these barriers to their executive leadership journey. Action really must be taken um, by boards and university leadership to mitigate the barriers um, for these African-American women. So mentoring can't be the only thing that happens um, you know, a lot of times if you'll see, um, and just because I work in this space, I know these things, uh, you'll see an HBC that has had a woman leader. And if, if it end, doesn't end well with her, you know, it'll be another 10 or so years before you'll see another woman leader um, at that institution. So boards must um, mitigate these barriers uh, at their level. Um, you know, and, and HBCUs must make a concerted effort to move away from the mimicking of the African-American church structure. Um, you know, it's kind of time out for limiting or, or restricting women's ability to ascend um, 
ascend leadership because your institution is connected to a church entity. So that is all I have. And I want to thank you for your time and consideration. And I think, um, I think that uh, there will be room for questions. That is awesome. Thank you, Dr. Sowell. That is an amazing presentation. Just, I'm wild. <laughs> I am wild. The, the facts and everything uh, presented is just awesome. Um, uh, Ms. Harrison wanted to know, should we, are we opening up a question right now? Uh, for you? those individuals who have media questions to share private uh, one-on-one uh, with Dr. Saul. We can do that between 1 and 1.30. Um, I do have a question. <laughs> uh, okay. Fire me. I'm like listening and I'm getting fired up. My notes, I don't even have, I got no more instruction paper. Like this is, yeah. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm listening and I, I remember reading an article, uh, just just recently reading an article about uh, Dr. Ruth Simmons, who just stepped down at her position at Prairie View a and University, wow. um, you know, after um, being pulled out of retirement, um, she came with an amazing CV uh, to pretty much rescue Prairie View. Um, and she did an amazing job doing that. And she brought her people with her and she brought money that was connected to her people, you know, with, with there. One of the things that I, I'm really curious about, because I know that even in that West Virginia State University, you guys received your, you know, had, had your first um, female president um, about two and a half years ago. And that it's a land grant institution, an 1890 mm -hmm. institution. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about female presidency um, in these HBCUs that are 1890 land grant institutions under the thumb of the 1862 institutions. And, you know, do you have any thoughts on that impact? Um, because I find that to be even more critical space um, and a space where black women or black individuals in general while they are leading hbcus they are part of this land grant system that can be um a different kind of weight to carry when your big brother don't look like you time to think of are there any 1890s 1891s that have women presidents at the moment, and I can't think of one. <laughs> um, I do think, you know, I, I have thoughts on the the, the uh, variations of the 1862s versus the 1890s, but um, it is a different weight to carry because you have this entity that is attached to your institution um, that is responsible for a great deal of your funding um, and some of your staffing. Um, and, and you really have to literally lobby your state, well, not lobby, because you're not allowed to lobby, excuse me. Um, you, you literally have to go to your state every year and make a case for why you should have a, a, a matching, um, you know, dollars matched from the federal government when your 1862 cohort, uh, you know, colleague doesn't have to ask for it to be matched is automatic. And the only reason why theirs can be automatic is because yours is optional. So, you know, I'm sure that that creates a uh, interesting relationship between the two, the two institutions. Um, because if you look at the history of the two, one couldn't exist, one had to exist in order for the other to exist in my home state of North Carolina, you know, North Carolina State exists really literally because North Carolina a and exists, um, you know. So I'm sure that for a woman president who is navigating, um, and again, I'm really trying to think of if there's a current woman at an 1890 institution, and I, I can't think of one, um, for a woman, there, there have been women, but for a woman who was navigating, you know, all of the gender barriers that we talked about, um, 
plus working in the community and then having to, you know, approach your state legislature every year and make the case for why you need several million dollars um, on top of your regular state appropriation, um, you know, that is a big burden to carry. I appreciate you sharing you know, the um, conversation around the uh, HBCUs are being grounded, uh, religiously sort of kind of founded in that way. Many of them founded the business of churches. Um, because of that, it influences uh, the way individuals at the HBCUs can be dealt with, um, especially if you're not affiliated with the church. You know, seen and I've experienced myself um, not being affiliated with a church and and as a result being blocked from opportunities of growth within the institution because it's so ingrained in that and especially when we're talking about separating church and state mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily happen you know at the HBCUs and it really causes um a lot of internal kind of stress for individuals trying to navigate that leadership um, trajectory there. Um, and I think it really impacts just your ability to kind of build healthy relationships in certain spaces there because it's so ingrained in, um, in the churches. So I just want to appreciate you lifting that and, and sharing that information. Absolutely. Well, uh, definitely. I just want to thank you as well. Um, Danielle, I do see someone has a question. Uh, I believe Ms. Candace has a question that you want to, that we should we address or just kind of close out and then leave that for uh, Q&A? Uh, Candace, if you had a question, do you want to, I didn't see it in the, in the box. Can you unmute and um, ask your question? So is there a separate quick Q and A? Am I understanding that, or is it okay if I? You want me to wait till the quick Q and A? That's fine. When, when is that? I just saw this linking up. That that starts right after this. Is at one o'clock. Okay. Yeah, right after between one and one thirty. Oh, uh, it's same link. No, you can just stay right on. Don't even okay. log out. I can. Okay. Yeah. I can. Okay. Well, uh, just before we get ready to end, uh, again, thank you, Dr. Stacey Sowell, uh, for spending this amazing hour with us. It, it is appreciated. Um, on behalf of ABERG, our colleagues, friends, and partners of the Division of Extension, um, we hope we can call upon you to engage in more meaningful dialogue. Um, I will definitely say three pearls that I can take away from the presentation, um, you know, mentoring is, is, is is possibly key and, and, and being a mentor, having those individuals possible or present, it can help out, um, especially as I am a black woman um, and I believe mentoring is awesome. Um, the, the second pearl about your presentation, you know, these facts that you presented for us today are not that far off. Like they were very recent, as you mentioned, 1980, 40 individuals were appointed and I'm like, wow. So, and then three, um, you know, just being mindful of being able to move forward. That is the gist of what I got from this presentation and being able to stay on purpose, um, how that may be as black women, um, women, a diverse women of color, you know, it's just awesome. So I thank you for the information that you provided. Very, very enlightening. Um, in closing, registration, um, the, the registration link will be added to the uh, chat, or I'm actually, I'm sorry, the evaluation link will be added to the chat. So please remember to do the evaluations. Um, as a reminder, Dr. Sowell's um, bio can be found on the share site. <clears throat> We've hoped you enjoyed yourself and you would return back for our series four and final series, February 22nd, with Dr. Paris Carter's lecture, Empowering Young Black Voices to Matter. <clears throat> Look for a future Zoom registration. And we thank everybody who was able to attend today. Thank you, um, individuals who are able to not attend, you still will have, they will have access to the recording. Um, and, and thank you for taking the time to be present with this phenomenal discussion.
um, for those who would like to stay logged on uh, to have a more intimate uh, Q&A with Dr. Sowell, please hold tight. Don't disconnect. And otherwise, happy Black history. Thank you for everyone who joined and have a wonderful afternoon.